and 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 those two things interact and so it's a complete period of being distracted between your thoughts and your environment and going back and forth between those two things now in a flow state what happens is you're able to get rid of one of those two things right you're able to get rid of the random thoughts and you're able to just concentrate on what's happening in the present moment and react to it right you're still you still think right it's not that you stop thinking it's just that you, you what you're thinking about is what is your sensation right you're you're thinking about what's happening in the present right you are thinking cuz like for example when you're rolling with someone in you know, jiu jitsu and you have to react to someone's moves and the only way to do that is for you to think for you to plan ahead right if I know someone's going to try to get me in a in an arm triangle, then I, I have to be able to, you know, t think two, three moves ahead of that and prevent that from happening. Uh, in the same way, you know, with something like archery or, or, or whatever, right? So meditation, right, which is, I think, a very unique uh, series of, of techniques that get you in a very specific type of flow state, right? Because I do think there's a difference between just uh, flow states and, and meditation, right? Although it does depend on, on how you would define something like meditation. I think for the most part, you know, meditative techniques get you in a very special flow state due to the fact that it's not just that you're thinking a series of thoughts that are related to an activity that you're doing. It's that, and, and this is true in the case of like mindfulness meditation, right? You're just concentrating on the natural sensations around you and you're ignoring everything else. And, and when something else comes to mind, a thought, anything, you just recognize it's there. You let it go away and you focus once again on the present. It's just complete acknowledgement of what's going on around you without you making a, a, a you know, without you just adding your own input into that situation. I think that's a really specific flow state. Uh, I think flow states in general, one of the beautiful things about them is the idea that they sort of dissolve the, the ego, right? Because your sense of self, the, the sense of you as a separate being from everything else in the universe is something that comes naturally when you're in a regular state of mind. Because when you're in a regular state of mind, that's what you need, right? You're having a conversation with someone, you're going back and forth with two people this could be considered a a flow state but if it's just you recognizing your thoughts and then you know being distracted by them and then coming back to your environment and then constantly going back and forth between your thoughts and focusing on what's happening around you then going back to your thoughts and focusing on what's going on around you that can be a huge distraction for a lot of people and it can sort of blur your way of thinking so when you're in a flow state the ego kind of dissolves because it's not about you anymore it's about the activity you're doing. You, you sort of cease to be yourself for a little while. You don't notice your own existence. You're just in the activity, and that's all that exists, right? That's why it's, such a, that's why it's so good for you. I mean, it's an, it's an incredibly healthy thing to, to enter flow states regularly. Musicians do it. People playing video games do it. People having interesting conversations. I mean, what we're doing right now, this could be considered a flow state, obviously. So... I mean, that, that's what I think about it genuinely, but I think it is a little bit different from, from meditative states because I think meditative states push it just a little bit further, right? Depending, obviously, depending on what type of meditation you're doing. Because, for example, in, in, a, in loving kindness meditation, you make a conscious effort to have thoughts, right? To have thoughts about a person and, and wish them, you know, good things and wish yourself good things and, and the world in general. So that's a very specific flow state right there that does include thoughts. Mindfulness meditation is sort of, you know, recognizing the thoughts and just letting them go by, right? But just understanding the, the pure sensations that are going on around you and accepting that, right? And I also think that, you know, and, and this is moving a little bit away from the idea of flow, but the idea of uh, meditation and stoicism, as much as I criticize it, they have a lot more in common than, than most people recognize. And, and that's that's what I think about that. Um, I want to get back to that in a second, but so I want to touch a little bit on, so the reason I think that they're, they're more of that uh, flow states and, and meditation are more alike is because, so obviously there's probably like maybe different levels of flow, but when I say flow states, 
I'm talking about. So, did you ever read that book or know about the book, The Rise of Superman, by Stephen Kotler? The Rise of Superman. Yes, it's called. Uh, I'll tell you right now. I was just looking at it. It's called The Rise of Superman. Uh, decoding. Hold on. Rise of Superman. Yeah, decoding the science of ultimate human performance. So it's the rise of Superman, decoding the the science of ultimate human performance. Um, this guy's name is Stephen Kotler, K O T L E R. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you when, when you read that book, he he uses the example a lot of uh, of extreme sports athletes, right? Like uh, like the Tony Hawk guys, those guys that do like the X Games, or whatever, and they're doing these crazy jumps on these 30-foot ramps and twisting their bodies around and flipping around and landing back on a bicycle or a skateboard or, or rollerblades or whatever that, you know, they're using. And um, they talk about, you know, in, in these moments, and oftentimes it's tied to, like, a life-and-death kind of moment, right? Like, it's somewhere where you could die. You know, like, you could easily fall and, and you know, land the wrong way and break your neck in one of these moments, or if you're surfing, you know, the wrong move, you fall off that board, and now you're 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 caught in a riptide maybe you don't make it back to surface whatever um it seems like it's tied very much to those moments and there's a feeling of which ties into me a lot with with a lot of what a lot of people are trying to achieve in meditative states and it's also ties into a lot with because you brought up ego death again to what people describe as psychedelic experiences where there's a detachment from your body and there's even a detachment from thought really because you're not thinking you're kind of the way I described it when I've been in it in the most extreme versions of it that I've felt during, say, a sparring session or or because I did compete in my younger years in competition. Um, there's it's it's like you're a passenger. You're not really thinking about the move. You're not thinking about, you know, step, step right, dip your head, you know, release the left hand, you know, you know, throw a straight, straight left punch or whatever. You're not thinking, um, you know, close the gap, put your head in the chest, you know, beat the ribs, whatever. You're not thinking that. You're doing it, and you're not thinking about it at all. It's happening. Everything's happening perfectly. You know, you're, you know, if you're, if you're sewing, I would imagine, you know, your, your stitching is landing perfectly. Each stitch is at the perfect point where each strand is the same exact length. If you're, if you're if you're writing, you know, your, your words are stringing together, and by the time you're out of it, you can look back on the experience and and sort of feel the moment, but you don't really remember thinking about the steps. Um, and that's that's when I talk about flow states, that's what I'm talking about. Because what a lot of people are trying to do when they meditate or use psychedelics or anything like that is to basically remove themselves from their ego, remove themselves from their body. You know, a lot of people are looking to like do the, the whole astral projection thing. They want to kind of have the out of body experience. And that's a lot what a flow state, those extreme flow states feel like. Um, but I do want to get back to what you said about uh, stoicism and meditation being more like. Can can you elaborate on that? Yeah, but I mean, first first I want to respond because you said something something pretty interesting, which is you know when when you're for example you're sparring right, you're at a boxing gym or, or whatever, and you're you're sparring, and uh, you're it's happening right the. Your body is reacting to what the other person is doing and, and is, you know, doing things that if anyone was watching it, anybody else watching that fight is like, oh, this person is planning ahead, right? And and just studying the, the way the other person moves and, and, and reacting to that. But to you, it just seems like this is this is happening, right? That's that's part of, of what I'm talking about when I say the, the removal of the ego, right? The ego disillusion that, that, that happens during flow states and, and meditation because it, it becomes like for example if you meditate and it's just focusing on the breath and uh, whenever you get distracted you focus back on the breath right you look at thoughts and usually people you know when they're when they're thinking they're like oh I, I keep thinking about this and that and that and they, they see it as something that they're doing but when you meditate and you see those thoughts you notice that you didn't bring them up you just sit there, you focus on your breath, and they come up, they pop up all on their own, right? So it's not really something that, that you feel like you're doing. And so that right there, that's a little bit of the, the you know, uh, dissolving of the ego right there. Because you're noticing what parts it seems like you're not really in control in, uh, in control of, right? 
And that's also connected to the idea of free will. Because when you notice something like that, it takes what, what feels like it's something that you can control and it makes it just a little bit smaller, right? If, if these little thoughts that pop up, like a friggin' pop-up, like an ad when I'm surfing the, the internet, or something that I don't bring up, then which thoughts are mine? Which, which thoughts are the ones that I do control, right? So that, that brings up that whole issue. To get back into the, the idea of the connection between meditation and, and stoicism, I think stoicism, it, it does in its own way promote sort of the some of the same principles that you see in, in, uh, in meditation, right? Due to the fact that it's the Stoics, right, they, they do have this idea of accepting on an emotional level whatever suffering comes your way, right? Whatever nature has given you, you accept, right? And, and accept doesn't mean that, like, you know, if, if you're going to, for example, if you're sick, to just let yourself die, doesn't mean that. It just means that you on an emotional level, right? Like on a mental level, you accept that this is happening. You don't waste your time like wishing, no, it was, you know, I, I, I wish this wasn't happening. I wish it was something else. I wish someone else was going through this. I wish nobody was going through this. You don't waste time like not, you know, like hoping that your experience was a different one because you accept nature as it is. You, you accept your circumstances and, and, and that reduces the suffering, right? The whole idea is that you wouldn't suffer if you you were you would be able to accept you know everything in your life as it is and not desire more, not desire less, right? That's very similar to sort of what the Buddha was was talking about. It's just a, a more um, a more Western sort of approach to it because when you sort look of at accept the Buddha, and release, right? Yeah. Yeah, the whole the whole concept of just, you know, getting past suffering, right? And how do you get past suffering? Well, one way to suffer is, is through the ego, right? Because if you have a sense of self, then you suffer. I mean, it's implied. Like, if you are an individual human being and something bad happens to you, then you suffer. Now, how do you get rid of that? Well, the, the, you know, the Buddha had this, this whole approach towards getting rid of that. Uh, I don't think you can get rid of that. I don't think you can get rid of suffering, depending on how you define suffering, by the way, which is also an important thing to consider. I mean, suffering happens in, your, it happens in your thoughts, right? And yeah. If you can't get rid well, of thoughts, you can't get rid of suffering. Right. Well, it, well yeah, exactly. That's, that's the whole point, right? Like, uh, I, I was talking to a, a friend one time. And we were discussing this very same topic, and, and he told me, like, well, if you're in pain, if you just broke a leg, you're going to suffer. You know, like meditation, your Buddhist techniques, they're not going to stop that from suffering. I was like, yeah, but if you think about the pain and you think about how much it sucks, then that, that's going to be the suffering right there. Right? So, like, if, if you yeah, talk... Yeah, that's the long-term suffering right there. Right. That's that's what they consider the suffering. They consider suffering a mental or, or spiritual thing, not not a, a physical thing. Right. Like if you have all this pain, but your your ego is somewhat dissolved and, and you have sort of, you know, you you observe the pain, but without seeing it as something that's being, you know, just happening to you and, 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 and seeing it as this phenomenon that's causing you all this suffering. Right. All those thoughts that would distract you and give you a, a sort of a, a way to think about the pain, a philosophy about the pain. You get rid of that and you just observe it for what it is and you take away all the suffering. Right. Because the suffering to them is the, the all those consequences and those those thoughts that that occur that give you a skewed and, and slightly or largely messed up perception of, of your environment and and all the sensations that that you have within it. Yeah, it's like, uh, you know, like I've had injuries and, and I've gotten pretty bummed out about them and they've, uh, you know, they probably haunted me longer than they should have because mentally I was like, why did that have to happen? And, uh, you know, it, it took so much away, so much time away from the gym and, and all this and that. And that, that, to be honest, was the real suffering because the pain was temporary. The, the, the solution came eventually, right? Mm -hmm. Well, a physical wound can heal, but if you spend the next few years you know, thinking on, damn, that, you know, I lost so much time because of that, or I lost my ability to do this because of that. That's the real suffering. You're right. 
Um, so, <laughs> I because you know we've talked about solipsism and, and stoicism and you know Buddhism and all these different things. I, I have this thing that I had been meaning to say, and I don't remember if I brought it up during our first conversation, but. Um, my, for example, my, like my introduction to philosophy would, came through the vehicle of martial arts, right? Like, obviously, Bruce Lee, um, big philosopher, big fan of philosophy, um, but also just looking at, because I got to, I, 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 look, I got to train in a variety of different styles, and, and since, since I was, for, probably from the time I was eight years old, I started with, like, Wing Chun, which happened to be the one, the style that Bruce Lee started with. Um, I started with Wing Chun, um, and I kind of learned a little bit of other styles of Kung Fu. Then I did Taekwondo. Then I did um, more styles of Kung Fu after that. I did a little bit of Hapkido. I did this sort of uh, grappling art. I did two different grappling arts that most people haven't heard of. One is it's kind of like a mix of Judo and Hapkido. It's called Hapkido. It's a Korean style. Um, and then there was another one called a Chinese wrestling style that uh, has its roots in Mongolian wrestling. It's called Swai Jiao. And... To me, the relationship with uh, the relationship between martial arts and philosophy um, gave me a very unique perspective. For example, I explained this one philosophy in uh, in Swai Jiao, which was basically like the the idea is be you know you have three ways you could go about it. You could be passive, passive aggressive, or aggressive. Meaning, if someone's coming toward you, could say, "Please get away. Please, please don't touch me." Um, as they get closer, you could say, please don't touch me, and then you put a hand on their chest and tell them to get back, or you, you divert their hand if they're going to put their hand on you. And then there's aggressive, where it's like, I'm going to flip you over, and I'm going to put you in, a, in an arm bar or, or stranglehold, or I'm just going to I'm going to pick you up and dump you on your head so you can't hurt me. Um, and then you look at something like Wing Chun, which is all about not using strength and, and diverting techniques and, and, ha and attacking from the right angles, because it was a style that was really created for smaller people, for women, so that they, they would be able to defend themselves without having to overpower because they can't usually typically couldn't overpower a male. Um, and then you go into something like the one of the styles that I mostly studied, which is like the southern it's called Southern Dragon Fist. And it's a very dirty style. Like, you know, it's not like the like the stuff you see in like a Jet Lee movie, these flashy jumping techniques and all. In fact, there's very little jumping and almost very little kicks. It's a lot of like joint locking and throat striking and um, arm breaking. Like, the techniques were, were basically developed um, for, like, real, like, combat situations, like close quarters combat. Like, you know, if someone grabs you, how to how to kind of break a grip and, and, and go for the eyes. And, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, it's hard for me to, like, talk about it and, and not demonstrate it. But the different philosophies, when you look at the philosophies in each style, like, you know the the dragon fist style that I did came was was heavily heavily influenced by Taoism, which takes a more like just nature is what it is and you kind of got to flow with it kind of thing. And so the idea with that one is if the fight comes, take the fight to them and be gruesome about it. You know, mm -hmm. whereas like Swai Jia was like, no, you should try being passive first. If that doesn't work, go to passive aggressive, and then the next level is just go aggressive. Whereas like my other style is like, no, if it comes to you, you don't look for it, but if it comes to you, you 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 definitely end it quick. Um, and so what that did for me is that it taught me that there is no one philosophy to follow. It's, they, they're all different tools. All philosophies are tools that, that can be, um, applied at different times. For example, you just brought up, if, if you're, if you're going through a tough time in life, maybe applying some stoicism to your life can be very beneficial because you can, again, uh, accept and release the situation, right? But... At other times, um, when things are falling apart in your life because of a lack of action, then you need to become more of a pragmatist, right? Um, when you look at philosophy, how do you look at it? Do you look at it as like, is, is this all just different ideas to consider? Or, because I look at it, again, as each one is just a tool. Each, each philosophy is a tool to be applied at a different time mm -hmm. for a different use, you know, depending on the situation. How do you feel about that? Well, I mean... For starters, the in terms of my general approach to philosophy and just knowledge in general, the, the first thing I do is, you know, go under the assumption that I, I may as well be wrong about every single idea that I have. And I mean that. I mean every single idea, right? That's something that I use on a, you know, for speaking of, you know, being a pragmatist, right? 
it, because it's useful. It's useful to consider the possibility that you might be wrong about everything. It's not useful in every circumstance, but it is useful when you're trying to learn something. When you're reading a book, it's useful to be, you know, under the idea that you could be wrong about all the ideas that you had before you open that book, because that means that you're open to the possibility of change should good evidence come forward that might lead you to recognize that you were wrong about something in the past and then you can adopt a better idea right and then there's on on the on the personal level right uh in life in general i try to look at things from from two perspectives i think we talked about this before slightly not very much but slightly the idea that you know i have uh, uh this this idea that i don't really have knowledge right like there's so much that can be doubted that if it can be doubted then it might be wrong you know like uh the idea for for example i talked about the scientific method and and uh all the scientific tools that we have today and and the limitations of that right which scientists do acknowledge right but but they're like okay well for pragmatic for useful reasons we still use science because it seems to be working for us right like why why not i mean under the scientific method, there's the assumption of cause and effect, right? There's been philosophers in the past that have talked about the idea that, well, all right, there's something that occurs, right? The, the, the supposed cause. And then there's the effect of what happens as a result, right? And he and sort of, sort of philosophers would, would say, well, it's cause and effect. How do you not just that this happens and then that happens? We don't know what causes the Right. So, like, for example, if I grab a glass, I throw it into the floor and it breaks, I could say, well, OK, the glass broke because I threw it into the ground. But then someone would say, OK, well, you, you got the glass and you threw it into the ground and then it broke. But the idea that that was the cause of it breaking, well, it's just one thing follows another. But because one thing follows another, that doesn't mean that one thing caused the other. Right. So there's all sorts of assumptions. And then there's the assumption of, of the idea of uh, that, that our senses, right, our senses can tell us something about reality, which is necessary because all science is based on observation. There's just no such thing as science that isn't based on observation, right? And then so some scientists would say, yeah, but we use tools that, you know, give us information that we can't use with our regular senses. I'm like, okay, yeah, but you're still interpreting them through the regular senses. Right. You're still using your eyes. You're still using your ears. You're still using all of these regular senses that as far as we know, even if we consider scientific evidence, they're limited. Right. There's so much that we just cannot see using our senses. So we rely on tools. But then the tools we use also rely on us interpreting the tools through our senses. Right. So there's a bunch of assumptions we have to make in order to buy any idea, as far as I can tell, maybe the the only idea that you can't doubt is uh you know what Rene Descartes was uh was was getting at which is I think therefore I am which is to say I mean I, I exist right because I have the sensation of existing and I think there's some people that might even you know go as far as to doubt that now in life in general that's not a very you know pragmatic way of thinking right like that's something that's useful if you want to just explore ideas and and think about things that you haven't thought about before and be open to change. But you, you also have to be open to the idea that, you know, you have to use what's useful. So there's what you know and what you accept that you don't know, right? On one side, that's, that's the whole philosophy of, well, I think therefore I am. There's all this stuff I don't know. I'm going to keep an open mind because I might as well be wrong about everything. And then there's the other side of you that demands action in life because you're a biological being. You're here and you have to make one decision over another. You have to, you know, you have to do things and you need a philosophy. If you're going to do that, you need a, a, something that's useful. Right. And so on that section, on, on in my general life, I use what's useful. Right. And, and what's useful is something you have to experiment with to figure out whether or not, it, you know, something works. So that's that's what I try to do. What I try to do is I try to have, you know, on one side, a mentality that figures out, you know, that, that tries to reach for knowledge and is skeptical of basically everything. And then on the other side, I have the other mentality that's like, well, what's useful and what should I use in my life and, and how should I live? And that's sort of how I try to, you know, look at, at and, you know, information and, and philosophy in general.
So it sounds like we're kind of we're, we're pretty much in agreement, right? Because it's like going back to the example of 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 you know suffering and maybe like an injury happening. Again, if you if you if you want to avoid sort of the whole situation kind of bringing your spirits down, then you would want to apply some stoicism to it. But if you think about the future, so I, I'm thinking about this because I got a buddy who who um, tore his patellar tendon playing a, just a game of catch at a barbecue. <laughs> like, he just I did a quick little hop up to catch a football, and mm. when he landed, a huge snap, and his patellar tendon snapped like clean off the bone. Mm. Um, this is a dude who who like worked out religiously every day. Um, you know, whatever. It's just an overuse injury. They didn't even know it was happening. And then, you know, one wrong move is his tendon snap. Um, at the time, he was working toward a specific goal of getting a certain certification. And I know people who, who weren't even working toward a goal like that, who were just working out to work out and got injuries. And then those injuries would just dump them down a rabbit hole of, of giving up and, and, you know, and complete, you know, suffering, basically. And... and you know, he he took it in stride. He was kind of like, all right, this happened. And now I got to the next step is, you know, the surgery. The surgery is done now. Good. Now I got to go through physical therapy. So he applied stoicism to not let it get to him. But then he applied this this idea of, OK, now I just need to get things done. Now I need to go through therapy. Now I need to go through rehab. Then I need to go through restrengthening, and you know I can do other things. Maybe I can't use my leg right now, but I can do other things to supplement in the meantime. And I think that you know, because I, I I like to tell people that there isn't one way of thinking. You know, your way of thinking has to kind of almost m sort of shift to to meet the demand of whatever the situation is, and. I think that that's something that, I don't know, again, to me, it seems like it's unique. It comes to me uniquely from, at least from my experience, through through martial arts. Um, when you, the, stop, the martial arts that you have done, you said you've done jiu-jitsu and some other, and you did boxing, uh, they have a philosophy, right? So jiu-jitsu is very much almost like a waiting game. You know, you go through your steps, you go through your movements, you go through your positions. If you get put in this position, there's an answer for it. Um, and then when you get into that position, that person might go into another position, but there's an answer to that. And you keep going until somebody essentially makes the mistake and, and gives up the position that they shouldn't have. Right. Um, and then in boxing, it's the same idea. It's like I have to be at the right place. I have to have my foot at the right place outside of this guy's foot. And, and my, my head has to be in the right, you know, line so that I don't get hit but I can deliver the strike and all that thing um, it's all I, I, I've been starting to look at philosophy as more than just like little sort of mental exercises but it's tools tools to be applied at different times for different situations and I, when I look at something like um, like stoicism for example I, I feel like that's the one because you know going back to your example earlier about it being like meditation um, I think that's the one that could probably, because there are, you know, there's some philosophies that are more generally applied than others. And I think that's the one that could be more generally applied to people's lives in terms of, you know, getting over a lot of the shit that, that's making people suffer these days, especially with like social media and the bullshit that goes on. You know, I, I sent you that message the other day. I was like, I made a post on somebody's Twitter and then I kind of walked away from it. And when I came back, I had a bunch of notifications. And I was like, I kind of got like a little excited because like, oh, shit, I'm kind of blowing up on Twitter. I got all these notifications. And I realized that it's just two people going back and forth for 12 fucking hours straight on a comment on a post. Like it was literally 12 hours straight of one dude defending Yang and one dude trying to bash Yang. Um, and in my head, I'm like, man, like. I think people really need to just kind of learn to, to, to let these things come into the fold. Like, I mean, I, that's what I did. I saw, I saw the comment. I made my, my little reply. And I moved on from it. That's it. It was over. You know, the moment is over. Like Joe Rogan's been saying, post and ghost. Don't, don't pay attention to the noise, you know? Um, what, do you, what do you feel, since you, you seem to have looked into a lot of different ones, which, what do you feel is like the most, like, generally applicable sort of philosophy that could be applied 